Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Law of Attraction, and it is part of God's Law series. It was presented in Gothenburg, Sweden, on the 7th of July, 2012. This is session one, part one. Well, welcome along today. All of you who, uh, n many of you new faces, so um, I'm pleased to meet you. My name's Alan John Miller, and the lovely lady who's st sitting behind the camera there is Mary Luck, and she's my partner. Uh, we're from Australia, so you'll have to put up with our Australian accent and our Australian English, which is sometimes difficult. It's often very slang, and uh, I have a habit, unfortunately, still of dropping the endings off of words, as you'll notice during this discussion. <laughs> um, Mary, Mary and I, uh, Mary claims to be Mary Magdalene, I claim to be Jesus. Whether you um, address that emotionally or, or intellectually or not during this discussion is immaterial to us. We, we don't, it doesn't matter to us whether you believe it or do not believe it. We would love to just have a discussion with you about a lot of different spiritual subjects. And in particular, we'd like to discuss with you anything to do with love and truth in particular. So that uh, is our focus today. If we just have a few sort of housekeeping things firstly. I think the toilets are on the left-hand side uh, through the exit on that side if you need to go to the toilet. If you do need to go to the toilet, if you could just be aware of the cameras if you're down the front and walk around the opposite direction to the cameras if you can. And that way, if it's happening during the session, nobody will uh, be interrupted by it. We actually record uh, sound and video record every single presentation that we do. The reason why we do that is we put everything that we do for free on YouTube and also on the internet. So if you uh, do not want to participate in that by just having your face on the internet, um, there is no way for us to avoid it, unfortunately. So uh, my suggestion is perhaps you need to reconsider being here if, if you, if you um, feel like you do not want to have your face put on the, on the internet in that way. Um, the reason why we do that is because people all around the world have many different questions about spiritual matters, about love and about truth. And what we find is that uh, often an audience here will ask questions that then benefits another audience somewhere else. And there are many people now who are watching or downloading these videos from the internet um, overseas. And that gives them all an opportunity to share in this discussion that we have today, uh, in, a, in at least some way. And so we often also get frequently asked questions emailed to us from people who have watched a certain discussion like a, a, that's recorded, and then they, that brings up all sorts of questions for them. And so what we do is we present everything completely as it happened. We don't edit the show. Uh, whatever happens, happens uh, today. Now, today we'll, be, we'll probably talk from about 1 till about 3 o'clock, and then I notice that everyone's brought along some food up the back. So we'll have a break probably from about 3 to about quarter to 4 or something like that. And then we'll talk from about quarter to four to about half past five this evening, perhaps. And if you feel you need to leave at any time, uh, or you feel that I've offended you in some way and you need to leave, that's fine. Um, please, please 
do not hesitate to go if you need to go or you've got another appointment tonight or something like that. Don't feel like you're interrupting me because it's very, very difficult to interrupt me <laughs> from anything. Um, the, the other things that we need to mention are you are, uh, we, we've, we, we were here only, what was it, would have been four months ago, five months ago now, wouldn't it, uh, for those of you who met me last time. Um, and we actually have only been home since then for three weeks. <laughs> um, we've been travelling uh, from the last time we came to Sweden. Uh, we went home uh, eventually on that trip and uh, then we finished up doing a lot of travelling around Australia as well. Um, which we only just completed six days before we left for this trip. And then we madly went home, got ourselves all packed and ready again, and, and then came on this trip. The main re reason why we came on this trip is there, was a, there were a couple of generous people in Australia who donated the funds for us to go on this trip. And so we'd like to thank them for that, the, their generosity uh, because it's meant that we can come to yourselves here in Sweden uh, we're going to be also doing a talk in London. We're going to be talk doing some talks in, in the USA, in Philadelphia. Uh, we're also going to be doing some talks in Barbados. And, and also three, uh, there'll be three weeks of talks that we're doing in Brazil. And what, ha what actually happened was that they gave us enough funds to travel to Brazil... Um, and then when we started working out the cost of travelling to Brazil from Australia, it worked out to be very similar cost to taking a round-the-world trip uh, from Australia and going to Brazil via going around the world. So that's the reason why it happened this way. Um, today, I would like to encourage any of you to ask questions uh, throughout our discussion. And in fact, uh, in a little bit of time, I will invite you to pre perhaps present some ideas of what you would like to have today's discussion. And if you can't come up with any ideas, I'll have one for you, if, they, <laughs> if that's OK. Um, what we generally do as well is um, we, we in, there will be today a discussion today, and there will be a discussion tomorrow. And, uh, and then on Monday, we are actually going up to Vilhelmina, up, at, uh, up north. Uh, because we have friends up there who are starting up a learning centre in Sweden, a, what we call a God's Way of Love Learning Centre, and we can explain a bit more about that tomorrow, perhaps. And, uh, and so we're going up to there to spend a little bit of time with them, uh, probably about one week, and then we go back to London, and that's our general plan uh, since we've come to Sweden. We're very surprised it's so warm. <laughs> Last time we came, it was very cold, remember? Remember we had that cold snap when it was minus 15 or so? Um, and, and for the first time I've seen many of your faces properly <laughs> because most of the time you had a, some headgear on and some, <laughs> some uh, coats and so forth. Um, of course, we're used to this kind of weather. This is, this is about the temperature of what it is where we live, like this pretty much all the time, with the exception of a few, maybe a month or so in the middle of winter. But we have come from our Australian winter, and, uh, but, but it's been very mild winter. We've had uh, very mild, mild weather in Australia, a uh, lot of rain. And I understand you guys here have had a lot of rain too. And, uh, and so it's been very interesting. Normally it's our dry season this time of the year in the northern part of Australia, but uh, it's been quite wet. So we've been enjoying some wet during the dry <laughs> season. All right, well... What would you like to discuss today? Is there anything in particular as a group? I say we need to have group consensus if you make a suggestion as to what you'd like to discuss. But uh, I've also got a suggestion just in case uh, you don't. Would you like to hear mine first? And then, and then if you don't like that subject, we can progress with another subject. Well, I was thinking today that you might like to discuss uh, with me some things about the law of attraction. And many of you have heard of the law of attraction. Um, so how many of you would like to have that discussion? Is there a few of you? Yeah. So is there anybody who would like to have another discussion and, and have some ideas about what that discussion would be? Um, we would need to use the microphone. So, so if we, when I point to you, if you just wait for the microphone, and you leave, when I point to you, if you leave your hand up, and then get, get in, and you need to put the microphone right there. That's it. Yeah, hi. Hi. Glad to be here. Okay. I, it's a surprise to you again. Yeah. I saw just yesterday 
um, the message is here. It's a blessing that I didn't miss this meeting. Thank you for being here. Um, well, I, I have a question about the power of the written things. How yeah. influence our life all what is written? The power of written words? St written words yeah. and uh, where do you live and... Uh, I would like to know more about that. Yeah, okay. How careful we does everyone? How does everyone else feel about that one? That's a bit of a boring subject for others, isn't it? To be, you can be frank here, you see. I know, I know many of you Swedes don't find being frank in public <laughs> easy, so we, we, we have to address that. Far away. No, I think you just talk for a bit boring. If you use it, if you use a mic. You're allowed to say it. No, I thought it was just a bit boring. Yeah, I feel I it's wasn't a very... wasn't interested in that. I do feel it's a very important subject because in the end you do get a lot of influence and a lot of people do not understand the amount of influence they are under externally. But, but I feel to do a four-hour discussion on the subject might be a bit difficult. Shall I proceed with the law of attraction? Okay. No worries. Well, let's do that. Now, I'm not going to have trouble with my microphone just flying around. It looks. All right. So what we're going to do today then is discuss this law of God that many of you have learned about. Many of you probably don't see it as God's law. <laughs> many of you probably see it as uh, just a law of the universe or a law of nature, um, the law of attraction. And um, before we discuss anything to do with any of God's laws, uh, I would like to sort of present a brief summary about some of the things that we need to be aware of with regard to God's laws. And so what I'd like is if you have any questions during this summary, that you just do not hesitate to put your hand up and I'll point to you and you can ask the question that you need to ask. But there's basically two things to bear in mind with uh, God's laws. Firstly... There is a hierarchy. hierarchy, there's an R missing in there, of laws. What I mean by a hierarchy of laws is that some laws take precedence over others and in fact have the tendency to make it seem like the law that they take precedence over is null and void in certain circumstances and situations. Now let's give you an idea of that. Let's say you've got a law called the law of gravity. And most of you have heard of that one? Yes? It, you, what, what goes up must come down, that kind of principle. Or if you throw something off, obviously the, the, the attraction of gravity will pull it towards the ground. Now that law, you could say, is a, what I would classify as a low-level physical law. It's a law that governs uh, many parts of the universe, uh, but there are other laws that, that supersede that law or take precedence over that law under certain circumstances. For example, the law of aerodynamics is a law that takes precedence over the law of gravity under some circumstances. So if you build a wing that's curved in nature that causes... The, the, the air or air pressure on the top of the wing to be less than the air pressure on the bottom of the wing, so in other words, you shape the wing like so, then as the, as the air is forced over that wing, the air here compresses and the air here expands, and that means that there's less pressure above the wing than below, and as a result of that, and I can see I'm going to fight with this mic now, as a result of that, the... Um, the, it provides what's called lift, right? And lift means that we can then fly. And when we fly, it's almost like the law of gravity no longer exists because we're now doing something that's completely like against the law of gravity. We're, we're in a very heavy aircraft, often hundreds of tonnes, and yet it can fly and it make it seem like the law of gravity does not exist. Does that make sense? But of course the law of gravity still does exist, doesn't it? It's still there operating. We've just found another law 
that supersedes it or, or takes precedence over it under certain circumstances and situations. Does everyone get that? So this applies to all of God's laws. All of God's laws have hierarchy. In other words, there are some of the laws that God has made that take precedence over other laws that God has made under certain circumstances and situations. And it's just up to us to discover the circumstance and situation. So potentially there might be other laws that uh, enable us to levitate. Does that make sense? And, and we'll call them, shall we, shall we call them the law of levitation? Now, we haven't discovered them yet. So, so that makes it a bit hard to use them, of course. But potentially those laws may exist. All right? and, and then above those laws, on another physical level, there may be a whole set of laws regarding teleportation. But we don't know whether those laws exist or not. Um, but it's possible they also exist, yes? And, and at some point in the future we may discover them. And therefore once we discover them and know how they work, we then can engage those laws. And when we engage that law, it's like this law and this law and this law doesn't exist under those circumstances. Even though they're still there, we're now overcoming those, if you, if you could call them, lower level laws. So what I'm suggesting, with all of the laws that God has made in all of the universe, is that every single law is a part of a hierarchy of laws. Everyone understand what I mean by that? So in other words, every single law has a, has a, has a position in which you can discover another law that can supersede or... It doesn't really supersede it, does it? It's, it more takes precedence over it. In other words, it's more important under certain circumstances and therefore takes action. So, firstly, first principle we needed to look at is that the laws have a hierarchy of some kind. Now, I have given a whole series of discussions uh, that are available for download on YouTube about the hierarchy of God's laws, about how the hierarchy actually works. So I won't necessarily go into it here about the hierarchy unless you would like more details about the hierarchy as we're going through this discussion. Is there any questions about the hierarchy of laws? You can see how that works? Okay. So the second thing that's important to understand is the laws all have a scope of operation. They all operate upon something. So for, so for example, have you noticed that the law of gravity is it's very dependent upon an atmosphere, isn't it? In the sense that if there is an atmosphere in a certain location, so here on Earth, for example, you can, you can engage the law of gravity, but if there is an atmosphere... Uh, so in other words, if you jump out of an aeroplane without a parachute and you engage the law of gravity there, but as the law of gravity is engaged, you accelerate towards the Earth and then you hit a time where you can't accelerate any further. And I forget, I think the speed is around 200 kilometres an hour if you're just falling. And you can't accelerate much further because now there are other things. There's the pressure of the wind, or your, if you like, or the atmosphere against your body that prevents you from falling as fast as what the law of gravity, gravity would normally dictate. So if we lived in a vacuum, the law of gravity would mean that we, as we accelerate, we would continue to accelerate right towards the surface of the Earth if we were falling. But on the Earth, because it has an atmosphere, as we accelerate, uh, we get to a certain terminal velocity, it's called, and then beyond that point, you can't accelerate any further. Right? So, so, so you can see that the law has a scope in the sense that it has an area of operation, but under certain circumstances and conditions, it, it just can't work any further than it has worked already. Secondly, each law has a scope in the sense of uh, what it operates upon. So we are very, very used in, to, in the physical universe to seeing all the physical laws. So you could say the law of gravity... 
I'll just, uh, I'll just write things a bit more clearly than I am. So the law of gravity... Can anyone see the green easily? No, it's not very good, so we'll throw that one away as well. And we'll use the black. Has, a, has, a, another, has a physical scope in the sense that it operates upon my physical or, or anything with mass. So it operates upon my physical body. It operates upon anything that has mass. Now, if something doesn't have mass or there's another law that involves it, in other words, it becomes a gas or some other kind of law involves or there's an updraft, therefore the things with mass don't fall to the ground. And that's why we have clouds in the air that have millions and millions and millions of tonnes of water sitting up there, but because of different laws, not just the law of gravity, they stay in the air instead of all falling to the ground. Right? So the law of gravity has a scope of operation. Now, we can then assume that if the law of gravity has a scope of operation and the law of aerodynamics have a scope of operation and all the other physical laws that we see have a similar scope, then we, we must also see that if we're going to talk about a law of attraction, that it must also have a scope of operation. And if the laws that we've looked at, so the law of gravity has a hierarchy, or it's a part of a hierarchy, if you like, so if it's a part of a hierarchy, then it would make sense that the law of attraction is a part of a hierarchy of laws. Is that, it's a logical conclusion that we can come to. So, the law of attraction, we could then state, is a part of a hierarchy of laws and it has a scope. It has a scope of operation. What does it operate upon? Well, the law of attraction operates upon very similar things to what all the other laws operate upon or many of the other laws operate upon. So let's look at the types of things that the laws can operate upon. Firstly, there is everything in the physical universe. So there we're talking about anything that we can see with our eyes or measure with whatever equipment that we've currently come up with measuring. And, and even some things that we can't see with our eyes still exist, like, you know, when we feel the breeze on our face, we know that we're feeling and we're breathing oxygen. It's something we don't see, but it is definitely something that we feel and benefit from. So we know that there are physical laws that affect all of the operations of those things. So you could say the scope of God's laws include physical, whatever is happening to us physically. In addition to that, we have what is called a spiritual body or a spiritual form. And there must be laws, just like there are laws that uh, operate upon our physical body. There must also be laws, it would make sense that there are, that operate upon our spiritual body. So you could say part of the scope that we have about the laws will be spiritual in nature. In other words, they'll operate upon the material that makes up our spiritual body. Now, have many of you, um, do, do all of you, are all of you aware that there is a spiritual body? Like you, you are made up of a physical body as well as a spiritual body? Most of you are aware of that? Because I'm very happy to digress on some of this discussion and fill in the gaps if, if you're not aware. So just yell out if you're not. So you could say that uh, part of our nature is that we have a physical body. So there's my physical body. Drawn very quickly, and there's my spiritual body. The two are joined together through a cord. It's called the silver cord. And also, uh, many spirits are not aware of, but we are also one half of a soul. Um, so this part is our soul, and that's our spirit body and our physical body. So, so the laws, all of the laws, operate upon the physical body, they also operate upon the spiritual body and they also operate upon the soul. This being the half of ourselves. So you could, you could view your physical body just as a robot that your soul uses in the physical world to express itself and experience the world. Does that make sense? And you could use the spirit body if you could view it this way, as a, as a more uh, finer construction of material that has a different set of laws that determine its construction. 
It has a genetic structure still. And this spirit body can only exist in... It exists in all forms in the universe, but it only um, can be seen by other people who are in the same body, if you like, most of the time. Although many of you at times have seen a person in a spirit body, or potentially. Um, the reality is that we can eventually see a spirit person. But you could still view that as a robot used by the soul to express itself in the spirit world. Does that make sense? All right. So... What I'm saying is that this is the real you and these two things are just the robots that the real you or the mechanisms, the physical structures that the real you uses to express itself. Yeah? Does that make sense to everyone? It's very important that you understand that because... We want to understand that the scope of the laws operate upon the three parts of our nature, not just on the physical level. And in fact, what you will find is that there are far more laws that God has made that actually operate upon the highest part of our nature, our soul, than there are that operate upon any other thing in the universe. So there are far more laws that operate upon the soul. And if we define the soul as the real you, that's your personality, if you like. That's the person of yourself, the personality. It's the emotions that you have, the desires that you have, the passions that you have, all the feelings that you have and so forth. That's the real you. And, and you know, sometimes what goes on in your mind is not really the real you, actually. Because your mind can be influenced by other people quite readily, if you think about it. Somebody can drop a thought into your mind. But it's very, very hard to drop a feeling into your soul without you being open and aware of that occurring. Okay. Is there any questions so far? Yeah, if we wait for the microphone. Just, can you wait for the microphone there? Thank you. I just can feel that I'm reacting on... Uh, uh, about personality and uh, real you. For me, personality is something that is created by our lives and our mind very much. Uh, personality is, for me, not the essence of the real me. Well, actually, I would say your personality is made up of two things. Firstly, it's part of what God created as a part of your being. But then also it's about your experiences. So it's a mixture of your experiences along with what God originally created or intended. So every single person that God's ever created was created differently to every other individual. And that's a part of what I view as their real personality. Often what a person portrays to the world is not their real personality, but rather a figment of their mind during their life's experience, which is not the same thing as their real personality. Does that make sense? Mario, with that slider I noticed, uh, just as a side point, whenever you put your finger on it, it actually, and slide it, if we set that level of that mic just once and leave it, um, it, you'll find that there's something wrong with that slider. I just noticed that the other, just as I was setting up. Yeah. Can, you, can you just speak into the mic again for me? You can say anything you like. Yes, okay. Yeah. That's now, better. Now I'm with you with the personality. Uh, there is a difference... Uh, there are like two personalities, one that is created by this life and then the real personality that you came here with, with, with your soul. That you can also connect to and develop, but, uh, but most, many people don't because what they do is that personality is often suppressed by their parents in favour of what their parents want the child to be and as a result the child goes up with a completely different, seemingly a completely different nature than what God created the child to actually have. So, so when I'm talking about personality here, I'm talking about the real part, the one that God created, not the part through the experience that was created. Does that make sense? Yeah, and yep. it's very important for me to make uh, a clear difference sure. there. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yep. Good. Okay, so, so if we call the soul the real you, right, then, then what I'm saying is that the laws operate 
upon the physical part of you, which I don't believe is the real you, because at some point in the future, that part will probably die and will be decomposed into the elements that compose this physical universe. And after all of that occurs, in the end, you'll still be you. So, so that's not the real you. And in fact, the, there is the potential that the spirit body as well may die. Nobody really knows that. But there is that potential that the spirit body will die. And, uh, but my feelings are the soul itself was created to live eternally. Right? And, uh, and in fact, to expand eternally. But the laws operate upon each one. So if, we start, if we're going to examine the law of attraction, we've got to expect that the law of attraction is going to operate upon these different levels of ourselves at different times. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So any questions before I proceed? Yeah, if we wait for the microphone, it's just around the back room. Just if you can remember to wait for the microphone, otherwise everyone won't hear. Uh, I, um, as you mentioned, uh, how the personal body and the spiritual body was in comparison with the soul, mm -hmm. you mentioned the word robot. I wonder if there is a special reason why you choose that word, or no. could you as well use tools for the soul? Or yeah, there's no special reason. Um, you'll find with me uh, generally, I'm pretty plain speaker, and there's no hidden agendas. <laughs> so, so when I use the term robot, it's just a, a way of saying it's a living organism um, that is used by uh, uh, the entity of our soul to express itself. And the soul doesn't need that living organism to exist. So, and this is, mm. and this is why I sort of view it like a robot almost. Like a, yeah. it's, a, it's something that's automated by the soul, something completely different. Yeah. I, uh, for me, many words uh, seem that they might be not the same. Uh, um, I, I agree. Uh, the same word for you as me, and there are many metaphors built in different things, like robot or tool. But uh, yeah. so I think and that I you would, also talk with and I in metaphors. Two, I would use those two metaphors uh, inter interchangeably. Like okay. the, the physical body is a tool mm. that the soul uses, or you could say it's a robot the soul uses, or it's a to be frank, what it is is a genetically structured living organism that is connected to your soul that the soul uses to express itself. Yeah. yeah, in a physical universe. Yeah, yeah. how do you uh, make a difference about emotions and feelings? You uh, use that word now and then. Yeah, I'm not uh, too uh, hung up on the different terms for different words, to be frank. So I often use the term emotions and feelings interchangeably. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not a person who goes into a lot of... Um, what I would call nitpicking, in, we say in Australia. What does that? What would you say here? Um, hair, hair <laughs> splitting. Yeah, yeah, hair splitting. Yeah. So I'm not the kind of person that will hair split about different words. And um, my feel, my feelings are that uh, emotions and feelings. While you could define some feelings as specifically as feelings, and some particular sensations you have as emotions, in the end. Uh, the way that I normally think of feelings are as something that you physically are able to sense through some of your input structure, which is your body, whereas emotions are something that come from within yourself, if we wanted to separate the two. But I sometimes don't bother separating the two in a discussion like this. So, so often um, I feel the soul is, a, is like a storing house of all of the different feelings and sensations that we've had throughout our entire existence, as well as all the different emotions that we've had throughout of our entire existence, as well as all the different belief structures that we currently possess, and, and, and also all of our intellectual nature, all of our personality, all rolled up into a ball, if you like, and I, I would call that our soul or our true self. And our true self can be damaged, I feel. Um, so a lot of people believe it can't be, but, uh, but I feel that our true self... Not, and I don't mean the self that God created us to be, but the self that we've embraced through the process of our life can get damaged through the choices that we make in particular. But also the choices that other people make can damage our true self. 
But I would still look at the feelings, the emotions as all being a part of the soul, the, the actual real person. And, and in fact, when you speak with spirits in the spirit world, uh, you'll find that uh, many of their feelings and sensations that they had when they were on earth, they remember them completely and they also have them in even more stronger um, sensations. So, so in other words, once a person leaves the physical and enters the spiritual life, often what they find is that their physical sensations increase in intensity through the spirit body compared with the sensations that we had in our physical body. And when you discuss these things with spirits, you'll find that almost every spirit recognises a huge increase in the sensitivity that they have towards their uh, sensations, their sensations of their body, but also their, their emotions as well. Yeah. Good question. Hello, AJ. I have a question, and it's two parts. I understand the physical body, and I understand the spiritual body. The spiritual body is one of them. Yeah. I know how it feels to feel the spiritual body, but soul, where is it? <laughs> and where I am, if um, if when I'm not in my spiritual body or in my physical body, yep. where I am. Okay, well firstly, there's your physical body. If we had to actually right now, because you are now consciously awake, right now your physical body is like that, uh, but I should probably draw the gender correction though, perhaps. Um, so, but you're sitting down, but uh, this is your body, that's your physical body. Your spirit body actually is almost identical to your physical body in its genetic structure and it overlays your physical body. It's a bit larger than your physical body and it overlays it. So, so it's right there with you right now. And then your soul is an energy structure that is not created by your parents but rather created by God and so it doesn't have the same structure. It doesn't have a physical form but it envelops both bodies. Do you understand what I mean by it covers over? It's like an envelope in which both bodies exist. Yes? So I'm with my soul all the time. How can I feel the soul though? When you say you're with your soul all the time, <laughs> let's define that, I shall we? I understand that it's around me. Yeah. So your physical body is not necessarily with your soul all the time, but rather is connected to your soul via the spirit body. So, for example, when you go to sleep at night, what happens is the two bodies that envelope each other just before you went to sleep, the spirit body and the soul itself go away from the physical body every night you go to sleep. Do you understand? And as you go away, your soul is still enveloping the spirit body, but it's the spirit body that has the energy connection with the material body. And there's a cord, and they call it a, a, a silver cord, but it's a stretching material. It's a, it's a chain of energy that transmits all of the, uh, what you would call nervous system impulses uh, via the spinal cord uh, to the spirit body, right? And as a result of that, it... Uh, what it does when you go to sleep at night, this cord maintains connection between your physical body and now your soul and your spirit body is elsewhere. So if you imagine it, you're lying down. So we draw you lying down, okay? As you leave your body, your spirit body leaves your body. So you see your spirit body will leave it and your soul is still enveloping your spirit body. And it's your spirit body that has the connection with the physical body via a cord. And it's an energetic structure in which information transmits back and forth. So when this body's bladder is full, it's transmitting to the soul. It's a, the soul is floating around in the spirit world in different locations and we'll talk about where and what later. And, and it feels the sensation, the bladder is full. Now, most of you don't like a wet bed. So you respond to that, right? You respond to that uh, call of the physical body, the physical body sensation. So the physical body is transmitting an impulse to the soul saying, I need to go to the toilet, I need to go to the toilet, I need to, right? And, and because you have to wake up to do that, 
unless you're willing to wet the bed, then the body comes back and overcloaks, and then you get up, go to the toilet, go back, go to sleep, and then go back to the spirit world again. Right? So this is what happens every single time you wake up from a sleep. There's a call coming from your body, from your physical body. And I'm just, sorry, just sort that out. It's going to be a bit of a nuisance. I'm going to have to definitely strap it down at some point. And so you now have this process going on between the, between the bodies. <coughs> just need to have a, cha- have a drink. Thanks, Anna. Okay. So the relationship between it is this. While you are completely conscious and awake, your body and your spirit body and your soul are all together at the same time. But when you go to sleep, your spirit body and your soul leave. And in fact, your spirit body is still connected to your physical body through this cord, but your spirit body can have sensory inputs, feelings and uh, emotions from the experience in its sleep state. So every single time you go to sleep at night, you are actually alive and awake in your sleep state, in the spirit form, having an experience. Now, most people on earth don't remember it because we're too afraid to remember it. And so we have a tendency to shut down everything we're afraid of, and so therefore we don't remember our experiences. However, many of you do remember your experiences, or at least parts of them, through the course of a night. And uh, that's an indication of what is happening. So what I am saying is the law of attraction, and in fact I'm saying that all of God's laws have a hierarchy and scope of operation which, which in particular affects this part of ourselves, the soul, the real self. But as a result of that will also affect the two bodies, the physical body and the spirit body. You want to ask Mary? I oh, just the lady's question was actually how do you feel your soul? How do you feel your soul? Yeah. Well, many of us do not feel our soul, unfortunately. It just depends on how sensitive we are to allowing all of our emotions and feelings at any one point in time as to how well we feel our soul. So if you could think of it this way, the best way to feel your soul is to experience every desire, every passion, every emotion, every feeling, every belief that you currently have. Now, now a lot of people say, oh, I do that. And we go, hang on a sec, just hang on a sec. You think about the course of a day. How many of you want to be at work when you're at work? How many of you feel like you desperately want to go to get up in the morning and go to work? So quite a, a number, about two or three of an audience, right? That's fantastic that you feel that way, by the way. Because that means that you're connected with your soul while you're at work. But for the majority of people in the Western world in particular, but also all through the world in fact, many people don't want to do the things they do during the day. Whenever we don't want to do the things that we're actually doing, we are disconnecting from our soul. We are putting our soul into a state of denial of its own experience. Because because to be there, we'd be unhappy. (laughs) Does that make sense? Like For many of us... If we're not happy at the, with the work we do, if we get up in the morning and go along to that job, we've got to disconnect from our feelings to a degree. We've got to disconnect from our emotions about that to a degree. And since we disconnect, we disconnect from our soul. So the way to remain connected with your soul is to remain connected with your desires, remain connected with your passions, your longings, your feelings, your emotions all the time. In addition... Do what they ask you to do when they are in harmony with love. So, the rest of us who didn't put up our hand about the job, if we were truly connected with our soul, we'd wake up in the morning and we'd say, I don't want to go to work today. And we wouldn't. (laughs) We wouldn't go to work. Now, a lot of people go, well, that's pretty impractical. Well, it depends. You see, if you had a job that you loved... Then you'd wake up in the morning, wouldn't you? And you'd go, I really want to go to work today. And in fact, would you even view it as work? You wouldn't, would you? You'd even view it, oh, I'm just going to get up and have some fun again today. That's how you would actually see your life. And therefore, you'd be much more connected to your soul. 
But for the majority of us, we've learnt through society pressure and different problems that we face during our life, we've learnt to suppress our desires and passions in favour of a practical existence, what we view as one. Uh, and unfortunately, we disconnect from our soul doing that. So to truly connect with your soul, you've got to stay connected with those desires and passions as long as, and live in the truth of it. Many of us have a partial connection with our soul in that we do connect with what we like and what we don't like. But unfortunately, we don't live in the truth of it. In other words, we have a tendency to ignore it too many times. So we, we ignore what we really would like all the time. You think about it in a relationship. Quite often in a relationship, there will be a feeling of discontent about something. And then what we do is our head clicks into gear and we go, well, if I raise that, the last time I raised that, she got really angry with me about that. I don't know if it's wise for me to raise And last time she raised it, we didn't have sex for a week and it was just terrible. And, and the last time I raised that, you know, she was pretty bitter with me. And, you know, like, and I go, well, I don't think I want to raise that. But our soul is really saying that we need to raise it still. And so this is where we start to do compromises. And when we compromise, we're actually compromising our soul. Right? So, so if you can bear that in mind, does that answer that question enough? I'm just going to try and fix up this thing of mine. That's a bit better, isn't it? Yeah. So. Yes, if we can. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, how do you see the soul uh, and the subconscious mind, soul, spirit, towards the subconscious mind all right let's uh, answer that question i've answered it quite a lot of times before in different discussions but let's look at it again so here's our physical body here's our spirit body and here's our soul so it's female in this case now what most people call their subconscious mind i would actually call the soul right now for many people it's subconscious because they're suppressing it constantly the truth is that you don't have to have a subconscious mind. You could have a completely conscious mind on every single issue. And therefore, the, the, the subconscious, the so-called subconscious mind doesn't really exist unless we suppress our soul. Right? That's, that's the feelings I have. We actually do have a mind which exists in our spirit body. And we do have a brain which is, exists in our physical body. But the brain doesn't actually store information. A lot of people in the medical profession believes it does, but it actually doesn't. It's the mind of the spirit body that stores a lot of the information. And proof of that is this. When a person has a stroke, a part of the brain dies. That makes sense? Everyone understands that? And yet that same person a few years later can remember the bits of information that they lost when they had the stroke. That means that the brain didn't store the information. The information must be stored in some other location. It's quite logical, isn't it? Yep. And the information is stored in another location, yes. The brain is actually a living organism that helps this robot <laughs> have the experience of the sensations that, that it is gathering through the experience. And that, that sens those sensations, as I pointed out to you, are past to the spirit body and then those sensations that happen in the spirit body are passed to the soul and the soul remembers every single experience from the moment of your incarnation yep. well um, can you imagine a society in which we're all all the time connected to our soul and that this would uh, not be chaos, but there would be some hidden harmony in the world? Yes, well, for us all to be connected with our soul and for there to be no chaos, we would all have to be in harmony with love. That's my belief. So as soon as one person got out of harmony with love, they would begin to create chaos if they lived in their soul. So that, I feel, is a good reason to put the onus back on all of us individually to learn to live in harmony with love with everything that we do. 
when we live in harmony with love, there would actually in the end be no chaos and everything would be very orderly, but also everything would be done with passion and desire and be joyful. And, and I do imagine a life like that. And in the spirit world where Mary and I have lived uh, for, for quite some time, there are places above the eighth dimension of the spirit world that are completely like that. That every single person is living in harmony with their soul and not a single bit of chaos. Everything is lovely, organised as well and, and beautiful to experience. And I believe that is a possibility for the earth. But it just depends on us embracing that possibility individually. Okay. Uh, my question is about the the mind. Uh, how what can we do so people cannot drop uh, bad ideas in our mind? How can we protect our mind? Well, the interesting thing about what happens to our mind is that it all happens because of the law of attraction. <laughs> so, if we understand how the law truly works. Then, then people would, uh, once we work through the issues of understanding it and we actually work through why, then nobody would be able to drop a thought into our mind that we acted upon without us being conscious of the action. Right? So, so the reality is we need to discover how this law works and then once we've discovered how it works, we have the ability then to utilise it in its full power. And the beautiful thing about all of God's laws is once you learn them, they all have tremendous power. Right? Every single law in enables power, actually. So a lot of people on the earth today, when they hear the word law, they go, oh, law, yeah, law is pretty um, constricting, you know, restrictive. But the way God's made law is that everything, every one of God's laws is, is expansive because every one of God's laws is based about, uh, on love. And when a, when a law is based on love, it is expansive. In other words, it, it includes all things when it's based on love. Laws only become restrictive when they do not include all things and when they are not loving. And that's what we need to bear in mind. So, so my answer to that question is basically what we need to do is learn how the law of attraction works. Once we've learned how the law of attraction works... We'll understand why people are able to drop thoughts into our mind or why spirits are able to drop thoughts into our mind that we act upon. We'll be able to patch up that area of ourselves that causes that to happen. And once we've patched up that area, we will attract. The result will be that we attract something different. Does anyone know what that beeping is? If you can turn off or silence your mobiles, that would be great. So does that make sense? Like, so if, again, if we understand the law better, we would then understand how it all works and how, how our lives actually fit together. Yep. Okay. Now, the scope of the law of attraction is specifically on our soul to the most powerful extent. So in other words, what I'm saying there is our soul determines how the law of attraction operates. And by the way, our mind does not determine how the law of attraction operates. So a lot of people will tell you about the law of attraction when they talk about it, and you might have read, like, who's watched The Secret or things like that. Yeah? They tell you how, you know, you can exercise your mind to think about a certain thing. I don't know if you've tried that but it's probably not that effective because the reality is unless your soul is engaged, you cannot attract anything, actually. So your soul has to be engaged. Now, for many of us, our soul is engaged without our knowing. In other words, we are subconsciously engaging things. And the reason why we're doing that is because we're in denial of a lot of the things that are in our soul. So, for example, many of us are in denial of our fears, and yet our fears will attract certain things. Many of us are in denial of our shame, but our shame will attract certain things. Many of us are in denial of our grief, but our grief will attract certain things. All right? And God's done it this way, and we'll explain more detail about it for a purpose, for a reason. Now, for many of us, because we're full of those emotions we do not want to feel, 
we're actually attracting a heap of events we do not want to have. And then we wonder, why is this happening to me? How many times have you asked that in your life? Why is this happening to me? I still ask it every day. Actually, the more sensitive you become to the law of attraction, you will want to know why everything is happening to you. Because everything that is happening to you has something to do with your own soul. Something to do with what is inside of yourself as to why it is happening. And so it, it is a freak in, in myself and Mary's relationship and life, it is the number one probably question. It's not the number one question, it's probably, but it's probably two or three down on the list as the questions that we would ask ourselves about any event that's happened in our life. Because we want to know what is in our soul that has created this event. And particularly if the event isn't a very happy event, we definitely would like to know so that we can fix it, so that we can only have happy events. Right? The reality is your soul has the capacity to attract only happy events without you trying to make it any different, without you having any effort involved. Right? That's the reality. That's how God created the soul. For many of us, that's not the case because our soul is full of different emotions and beliefs and so forth that are in confrontation with love and therefore in error from God's perspective and God's trying to clear them out of us. God's trying to help us to not have them, those beliefs anymore. And so we're going to attract events that show us that we have beliefs that are out of harmony with love. So let's talk more about that. But does everyone get that it's not your mind? In fact, you can experiment with that. Like if you go home tonight and you, you, with your whole mind for the next one day, focus on attracting a million dollars into your bank account on Monday. Right? Now, if your soul was truly engaged, I believe you'd be able to do that. But if your mind is only engaged, for most of us it would be only our mind engaged doing that, we'd wake up Monday morning, check the bank account, and it would still be the same. And in fact, after two more days of life, it might be actually even a little bit less than what we had. <laughs> and, uh, and the reality is we can experiment with every single law God has made and discover how it actually works. Every one of them works predictably, just like the law of gravity works. Does that make sense to everyone? So we can experiment with these laws because they're all predictable. So if, if you don't get a result, then it means there's something else going on inside of yourself that could cause the lack of result and that we need to examine and look at. Yeah? And we'll talk about that as we proceed with this discussion. All right, so in summary of where we're up to so far, God's laws are a part of a hierarchy of laws and it would be nice at some point to know where it fits in the hierarchy, wouldn't it? And then God's laws are also all have scope. They all have a scope of operation. And for all of them, actually, there is a definite scope of operation and that are across a large area, including our physical, spiritual and soul-based life. So it is very important for us to understand. And then the last statement I made was that the law of attraction primarily operates upon the soul. Okay. Now, so it's great that we've asked some questions about what the soul is, but we need to go into more details about what the soul is, don't we? If we're really going to understand the law. Right? And in fact, I would say the law of operation uh, operates upon what I would classify as our soul condition. So probably what we need to do is define what soul condition is. Yeah? So let's do that. So this is the thing we're looking at, the soul condition, and we're trying to define it now. It is the total... of all of 
my emotions, feelings, beliefs, um, you want to add more? Desires, good. So let's add some intentions. Even so, it's even a part of what I'm going to do in the future, not just not just what I'm choosing to do right now, but what I intend to do is even going to attract some certain, certain things as well. Anything else you'd like to add to that? If you can think about this, if we go over here, thanks, Rita. If we can wait for the microphone, because everyone can hear them. Um, I, it's, I think it's part of belief system programmings and conditionierungen, con conditionings. I think it's a Good, different yes, one, so like in German, conditionierung, like what we trained to be since childhood programmings. So, so could we call all that childhood conditioning? Yeah, yep. and programmings, yep. yes. Thank you, AJ. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Anything else we could add? Exper experiences. Very important to add to our experiences, yes. Because we remember our experiences, don't we? So it's also a part of our memories, isn't it? Yeah. So, because obviously if you don't have a, ne a negative experience about some particular area then obviously you'll come into a situation that has that happening and you'll be fresh. You, you won't have a preconditioning. But if you have a memory of something bad happening in a previous example of that kind of situation, then you'll come into this new situation with conditioning, with, with some kind of changed way of looking at it. Yeah? Yeah. Is there anything else you could think of that would add, it, add to it? Now, I think I've written down, I've written down some additional things. So... That's a lot longer, so I'll, I'll read it out. Your passions, desires, longings, moral beliefs, moral condition, aspirations, pursuits, emotions, feelings, intentions, loves, dislikes and hates, fears, religious beliefs, scientific beliefs, love beliefs, mental aspirations, and beliefs. All of that makes up your soul and its condition. Right, so that, and by the way, this outline, if you want to download it, it's actually on the net um, on our website. So I'll give you the details of that later. So, so we have the sum total of all of these things that are what is going on within our soul. So our soul has all of these things added together. And that makes up what I would classify as our soul condition. And that is what's going to drive the law of attraction. So can you see it's a bit more complicated than just going, oh, I can think about something and it will happen type of thing. We need to understand ourselves to really understand what our soul is going to attract. Now, of course, many of us do not understand ourselves. Many of, us, many of us, in fact, ignore most of our fears. We ignore most of our shames. We, we, we try to stay away from some of our beliefs. Some of our beliefs we'd rather not even have, but we have them anyway. <laughs> right? and, uh, and those things all determine what happens to our, to our soul and therefore will determine what happens to our physical and spiritual being, our, our, ourselves. Okay, so, this, so that's our soul condition. So I'll just write that there instead of that. I'll just put that there, soul condition. The question then comes, can you change your soul condition? Yes, of course. So the, the fact that all of these things are changeable... Uh, to a large degree, means that we can change our soul condition. If you can change your soul condition, then you can change what you attract. 
So how do you attract new things? You don't attract new things by trying to attract new things. You attract new things by trying to change your soul condition. And your soul condition will automatically attract new things if it changes. Now, this is in both a positive and negative direction. So if you attract things to your soul and you act upon certain things out of harmony with love and more in harmony with things like violence or rage or fear or anger or all of those kind of feelings, then your soul condition will degrade. As your soul condition degrades, you will attract even more difficult circumstances and situations. Does that make sense? If you act in harmony with love and truth in all of the things that you choose to do, your soul condition will improve. If your soul condition improves, then what you attract will improve. So, what do we say about this soul condition in, in terms of a summary? We need to say, don't we, that we have a choice that it involves our free will. Choice. Yes? So let's look at the effect of free will on our soul condition. If I use my will in a loving and truthful direction, then my soul will improve. And therefore, what my soul attracts will improve. If I use my free will in a fearful and un unloving, and, I, and notice I use the term fearful as opposite to truthful, because, because fear is often created by me not knowing the truth about something. That's when you usually become afraid. Right? So in a fearful and loving direction, then my soul will degrade. So, this is very powerful to know these particular things. Firstly, remember that it's not what I intellectually do that determines what I attract. But rather, it's what my soul is already doing that determines what I attract. Right? And what it's doing is it already has feelings, it already has emotions, it already has beliefs, it already has all of these conditionings and everything else in it that is automatically attracting specific events and situations. And we'll look at why in a minute, why God's designed it like that. If I understand that, then I can understand that if I am loving and truthful and use my will in a loving and truthful direction, then I have the ability to improve this condition and therefore, by, by effect, improve what I attract. If I operate my soul in an unloving and fear-based direction, my soul will degrade in its condition and as my soul degrades in its condition, I will then begin to have worse feelings and worse emotions and worse desires and even I'll have maybe even more damaged intentions. Right? And that will cause my soul to attract much harder, more painful experiences as a result. Make a new task I haven't been doing for a long time. Yep. And I was really, really nervous. And I knew about the law of attractions. And I know, oh, now I'm going to create very bad things for myself. So I asked for help. Yep. That's what I did. Yep. I asked the universe, God, to help me. So this, I know, I know I'm nervous, so please help me. So I will create a very a good experience. And it turned totally around. I have a real good time. Yes. And um, if we can point out that it's not the, also not just the emotion that exists inside of you with regard to the law of attraction, but it's your consciousness of it that drives a lot of what happens. So, so if you are more conscious of something appearing inside of you and you know it exists there as an emotion, you'll find you'll attract even less negative events just by becoming conscious of it than you will is if you operated in an unconscious manner with it. Does that 
make sense? So, so what happens for most people in their day-to-day life is they are very unconscious of what's going on in their soul. In other words, they are unconscious of what they feel. They are un- unconscious of their true beliefs, you know, their true feelings. So you ask the average person, for example, whether they hate their mother, and most people would say no. But when you start discussing with them how they actually feel about their mother, a fair majority of people finish up saying, well, yeah, I don't like her very much. (laughs) And so therefore uh, feeling, uh, often specific feelings in their soul towards her as a result, right? And, And so we often want to remain unconscious because we're afraid of actually facing up to the truth of a lot of our emotional state. Once we go out of that fear and into a condition where we want to see that we're a certain way, so in other words, in your case there, wanting to see, yes, I am nervous. Now we're in a state of acknowledgement of a particular issue that we face. As soon as we get into a state of acknowledgement, our law of attraction, our soul has instantly improved on that particular issue and therefore the law of attraction will improve on that particular issue as a direct result. Yeah? And then when you basically prayed for assistance or help or wanted help from other people around you, spirits probably, too, to help you through the experience, your consciousness improved again by seeing that people around you want to love you and care about you. There's an act of love towards yourself. Your condition of love improved again. That attracts even better situations. Does that make sense? So, so the, the beauty is once we are conscious of a problem... That is far better than being unconscious of the problem. Now, unfortunately, on the earth today, many of us believe the opposite. You know, what you don't know can't hurt you type of feeling that we have. Um, what you don't see, you know, ig- ignorance is bliss, we have a saying in Australia. Do you, what, do you have a similar saying here in Sweden? Ignorance is bliss. Uh, is the saying in English. And the reason why we have that saying in English is that a lot of people believe that to know something just means you're going to have more pain. The reality is with the law of attraction, if you know something, your soul condition is automatically improved on that particular issue. And therefore, you'll have a better attraction. Your attractions will be actually much more powerful in a positive direction. So it's actually better to not be ignorant than it is to remain ignorant. Okay. Any other questions that we can proceed with there? Yeah. All right. Yes? I was uh, just um, participating in a seminar in London a mm-hmm. couple of days ago. And um, as the world economy looks today, then there are only a few percent of the human beings that own and earn the most of the money yes. in, in this world. So with this law of attraction, what would you say about that? Would you say that these people, they are able to attract all this money and they do it in a accordance to the law of attraction? Or how do you look at this, also this, what I call greed and so in the world? Well, let's make one statement to cover everything that happens in the world and in the universe. Every single event that happens, we attract. But it's not just an individual attraction, there's a collective attraction involved. Now, if that's the case, then yes, I must agree that, that a person, to, the whole world has attracted that a few people have most of the money. Why have we attracted that? Why do we even value money? We need to even ask why we've attracted that. Because the reality is most of us value money, many people in the Western world in particular value money above many other things. Why do we do that? There's a law of attraction in operation there. So understand that absolutely everything that happens in the world around us and to us is actually involving this law. And we need to understand it far better to understand how that happens. Now, I'm not saying that having money is a good thing. Because I I believe if we were in a developed society, there would be no money at all and in fact everyone would have a house everyone would have you know means of transport everyone would have food everyone would have water there would be no money in a truly developed society there would be no money 
And that's what I mean by that is that in a society that is dictated by love, everybody would be giving gifts rather than needing money. So if I had something that I recognised you need, I'd give it to you if I could. And if you had something you recognised I need, well, you'd give it to me if you could. That's how a truly developed society would work. The fact that we develop society around an economic structure that involves money is an indication of how poor our soul condition is with regard to love. So, so that's what... And the fact is, if we honour a poor soul condition with regard to love, what can we expect as the outcome? We can only expect negative results if we honour these things. Many of us continue to honour these things. And it's the honouring of these things that are out of harmony with love that causes most of the pain in our lives. In fact, it causes all the pain in our lives. And so I, so I feel that when it comes to the world's ec economic structure, which is all to do with a few people having a lot and, and the majority of people having next to nothing, in fact, um, we have a, a lack of the even distribution of resources on the planet and why would we do that? If we loved each other, we would not do that. So it's only greediness and other types of emotions that are part of the soul condition that drive those actions. So many times, people who have a lot of money have a lot of greed inside of them as well, many times. And in fact, us in the Western society have more greed than many of the people in other societies because we have more money and we're not willing to give it away. We're not willing to share it. You know, Sweden is one of the few countries that has a more open policy with regard to immigration, yes? If you compare your immigration policies with immigration policies of most of the Western countries, you'll find most of the Western countries don't have similar policies. And in fact, many of them are so tight that they won't let somebody who's being raped and hurt somewhere overseas to come into their country in order to protect them. That, that's a lack of love. It's love that's driving these things. So it, what we will find, in fact, is that God's law of attraction is actually very much based upon his even higher laws of divine love. So, so you will actually find that love is the underlying reason why God created this law. And we, will dis we want to discuss that now, I feel, as to how love is involved in whatever happens with regard to this law. Okay. So let's look at the effect of love on these things. Now, love is the most powerful force and also the most powerful emotion you will ever experience. Could you agree with that, do you think? You, you think about how, when you fall in love, what happens to the rest of your life. Right? It sort of pales into insignificance, doesn't it, in comparison to that love. So love is the most powerful force and the most powerful emotion you'll ever experience. Now, God created it that way, of course. In the creation of love being the most powerful force, it, there are actual laws involved around love. Like love operates under certain conditions and therefore under, um, there are certain principles involved with love that operate. And God created the law of attraction only for a loving purpose. And this is the loving purpose. It is God's messenger... of truth to you. So this law of attraction, even if you had no other person to talk to in the universe, God would be able to talk to you through this law by showing you what your condition is at any point in time through what you attract. So it's actually God's messenger of truth to you personally. What is happening to you right now, individually and collectively, is all a part of this messenger of truth, what God is trying to tell us about the truth of God's universe. Now, 
The truth of God's universe is that it is always love. So just put love up there again. All right. So everything that God is trying to tell us always has a message. An underlying core to every message is about love. All right. Every single thing God's trying to let you know about is about love. And the way God uses this law of attraction or created it to, to be used is this. It is a, what I would classify as a feedback system. Do you know what I mean by a feedback system? Yeah. It tells you exactly what's going on in any moment. But it's a feedback system for the soul, not for your mind and not for you what you would like to have happen to you, but it's a feedback system for what is actually inside of you, your soul condition. So it's a, it's a very truthful feedback system in comparison to many of the other feedback systems. So for example, if I was a drug user and I had some mates with me, some friends with me, and they were all drug users, and we all decided that we were run out of drugs, so it's great to go down and rob a store and, and so we can get some money to buy some more drugs. And the feedback system of my mates or my friends would be, yes, let's do it. Is that not right? Because we're all in agreement that we all need some more drugs to get our fix. And in fact, most of society is like those drug addicts in a way. We have, we have our fixes or our um, addictions that we would like to have met. And so our entire society finish up gets, getting created around meeting the addictions we have. Right? And we're all in agreement with it because we all would love to have our addictions met. And so we automatically embrace that kind of society. But the feedback system that God's created is telling us already that the way we've constructed our society is not in harmony with love. Because there's so much pain that happens as a result of what happens in society. So it's automatically feeding back to us that something's, out, something's wrong. Something's not right with the way we're doing things. So it's a feedback system for the soul, but it's also a feedback system for collective souls so it's not just a feedback system for my soul but it's a feedback system for all of our souls whether we're aware of it or not so God's created this feed, beautiful feedback system based around love that's trying to tell us the truth of every single thing that happens to us and basically what he's trying to tell us is that's out of harmony with love. That's in harmony with love. That's out of harmony with love and so forth. It's a, it's a way of measuring what's in and out of harmony with love. Yeah. Now if we see the law of attraction as that, can you see we're going to enjoy it rather than fight it? See what happens for many people once they learn about this law, they go... Why is this damn law of attraction bringing me this thing? Uh, whatever the event is. Instead of going, it's beautiful this law of attraction has brought me this thing. All of God's laws are loving. Everything we attract is loving in the sense, and I don't mean that everything that happens to us is loving. I mean everything we attract is loving in one sense, and that is that we have the opportunity to learn about love through whatever we've just attracted. We, there's a message system going on here. So if we refuse to connect to God, which we were allowed to do if we want to, like God's not saying, you have to connect to me and if you don't, I'll strike you dead. Uh, now, a lot of religions would like to have that uh, as an idea, but it's not true. How many of you have sworn at God and still not be struck dead? Uh, so, so if that's the case, then it probably is proof that God's not going to strike you dead no matter what you do, right? And there's plenty of people that do very, very negative things and they never get struck dead. So that tells me that God doesn't strike people dead for a start. Secondly, we need to understand that the law of attraction is the messenger that God has to allow us to exercise this other gift of love that we have, which is, remember I wrote it before, this gift of free will. So this is a loving gift God gave us and God's basically saying to us, look, 
If you use your free will in a loving and truthful direction, then you'll find the law of attraction that I've made will operate beautifully for you all the time. But when you use your free will in a very negative direction, in an unloving and fear-based direction, then you'll find my law of attraction will be the messenger of truth to you, telling you that actually something's wrong, something's going on. Now, this applies to absolutely everything that can happen to you, even every disease that happens to you, every illness that happens to you, everything that happens to your body, every wart you have on your skin, every injury you get when you're chopping up the vegetables or something and you get an injury. That's a, an event telling you something that's happening in your soul. The key is just how do we go about discovering the, what it is. That, that's the key. But it is God's messenger of truth every single event that happens. Every single event. Thanks, Rita. I have a problem to accept this because I think about children yes. uh, that have parents. They do hurtful things. So the people that are starving, is that because they have a, a problem with their soul? From another life or, no. or the collective and and how can that be fair and loving in that case good question very good question so so here we have a group of adults right and it might be a mum and dad and then we have a little tiny child right and this poor little child is having a lot of things happen to it that it does not deserve i agree so when i say the law of attraction is perfectly loving, though, in every situation. If these parents were loving and made loving choices, they would see the damage they are doing to their own child, would they not? And they'd want to improve that, wouldn't they? Right? So, so when the child has a sickness, for example, the parents would go, OK, what am I doing to create my child's sickness? There's got to be something I'm doing that's causing my child... Because the, the child doesn't have a fully developed sense of its own will, does it, at, that, at a young age. And if, that, if that's the case, then it has to be the parent's will that's being forced upon the child if the child's getting sick. So the parents would automatically start looking and going, OK, there's something going on inside of me here. And to be honest, if I can't love a child, am I really going to be able to love anyone? You think about it, a child... A child has no self-determination. They have an inability to protect themselves. They have no personal security that they're able to maintain themselves. They can't fight anybody because everyone's bigger than they are. Many of them at a, very, at a baby age, they can't even feed themselves, clothe themselves and, and care for their body in such a way to keep it clean. So they need somebody else doing it, do they not? Now, if we as a society and as parents see the pain in this child and yet think it's something that's happening in the child, we've got a problem. So the law of attraction here is telling us that actually we are the problem when these events happen. So you know the 50 million children that die of starvation every year on the planet? That should be telling us all something. But, it, but it's not because there's still 50 million that died last year and we didn't change it. Right? And they died of malnutrition. We didn't change it. So it's not telling us enough, obviously. Right? There are over 300 million abortions every year. Right? And they're all children. They're all live children, of course. So that's telling me something. That's telling me that we do not love children as much as we think we do. Uh, otherwise, none of these events could be occurring in a developed, loving society. They wouldn't be occurring. Huh? So, so when I see a child being harmed in any way, the first question I ask myself is, how have I contributed to their harm? Because they are unable to protect themselves. They are unable to act themselves. So it has to be the people who are acting towards them that are causing their harm. And I'm one of those persons who's living on this earth, so I need to question how I've contributed to their harm. 
So when I see 50 million children die every year of starvation, I've got to look at how I contributed to their harm. If I was in a loving society, we would all do that. Can you see that? We often don't. Because we go, oh, that's happening in Africa. Or that's happening in Ethiopia. It's not in my country or whatever. And that tells me that I don't yet love the children enough to understand what the law of attraction is showing me. The law of attraction is showing me something. The law of attraction is demonstrating to me that I don't love children enough yet. Because if I did, I wouldn't be sitting back idly in my personal life allowing this malnutrition and starvation to go on. Now then we go, well, what can we do to improve it? Well, there's literally hundreds of things you can do just living right here that would improve their situation. One would be to give up eating meat. That would greatly improve their situation. Because the reality is it takes 10 times more resources of this planet to provide the same amount of meat as it does to make, provide the same amount of vegetables. So that means that I'm using 10 times the more resources than those children are. Now, to me, I would go, okay, if I really loved, would I continue to choose to do that? You see, these are all personal questions that we need to ask ourselves. The law of attraction is perfect in that it brings me the event. The event in this case is the harm of the child. And I am now conscious of the event. So therefore I was involved in the law of attraction that brought this event because I'm conscious of it happening. And now that I'm conscious of it happening, I need to do something with my life. If I'm truly sincere, I would exercise my will to do as much as I possibly can given my circumstances to actually undo this damage. And that means I'll need to make some soul changes. Yeah? You want to say some more? I just, you but, oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. That's yep. a nice answer. But it still it doesn't answer uh, about the condition of the child's soul. Well, let me point out that whenever uh, parents become pregnant, and as soon as at the time of conception... This child is now absorbing the parent's emotions. Does that make sense? Because of that, it's now absorbing the parent's beliefs. It's absorbing the parent's feelings. It's absorbing. It, this child is highly likely to grow up to be very, very similar in a lot of ways and a lot of belief systems to these parents as a result. So the child already has a group of emotions in it that are attracting these events. Does that make sense? But it's not the child's fault. And what you're getting, I feel, confused with is who's responsible and who's not. Right? Obviously, people who are adults, who are able to exercise their free will, are far more responsible for what is happening than a person who is a child and who is unable to exercise its will because it's being controlled by its environment. So from God's perspective... The law is acting primarily upon the parents and it acts upon everyone, of course, without discrimination. But, but the parents are the ones who can be conscious of it and therefore the parents are the ones who need to change. And yet it's interesting, I find when I have these discussions with parents, parents are very resistive to changing, very resistive. And it's interesting, they're very, they often talk about the harm that's done to children in other locations and yet, many times the parents are doing just as much harm to their own children right at that moment and yet don't want to know about it. And in fact, we had a parenting um, seminar once. It was a two-day parenting seminar. And the children came up and talked with me uh, in front of their parents about how they felt about their parents and what their parents were doing and all sorts of things like that, which was very confronting, <laughs> as you can imagine, to the parents. And yet, even with all of that, the parents were really angry and upset about the children doing it. Instead of just looking at, this is how my child feels, wow, like, there's something I'm creating here. Yeah. So, Mary? I just wanted to maybe clarify or comment about what you're saying there. This has been a big question for me for a lot, like, for a, I had to emotionally resolve this question myself. Yes. And um, I think a few things resolved it for me. Uh, one was when bad things happen, 
um, we want to blame God and say God's punishing us rather than viewing the law of attraction as a law that helps us learn love, basically. Yes. Um, so when something bad happens, we see it as punishment and we, we don't see it as an opportunity to learn about love. But also this second thing about children, when, when someone's... De- would you agree that when someone's learning about... They have less. Um, they have less impact impact on the law of attraction, or the law of attraction is going to operate on things that they're unconscious of at that time because they're still learning who they are and about their own will. Yep. As they grow, as we all grow into adulthood, yep. then we know about our own will, and we also. Oh well, I don't know. I this is I, my question. Yeah, my, my feelings are that most adults on the planet do not know anything about their own will. They've got no idea how their will and their choices affect everybody else around them, how they're affecting themselves and all of those kind of things. So my feelings are that, for a start, most people on the planet have no idea how to access their own will. In a lot of ways, most people on the planet are like children in adult bodies. And in fact, if you look at the many emotions that people have in certain pressure at events, they act like children in adult bodies. Yeah. And, and that's an indication they have no idea how to express their will in a loving manner. Secondly, uh, but I do feel there are some questions about blame and responsibility that we need to address here. And, and we need to address them quite clearly. Yeah. So, so and, uh, sorry, just on. one other thing, if we could address when other people have control over our will, I suppose. Yeah, that's well, that's about responsibility. Okay. Yeah. 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 So let, let's look at these two issues of blame. So what we normally do with blame um, is we blame everybody else but ourselves. Isn't that the way it works when we have something negative happen to us? You know, it's somebody else's problem, right? So. You go home and your flat happens to be robbed. Who do you blame? Who would you blame? The thief? Uh, so I, I, the thief? Who else would you blame? The, maybe the police? Right. You might blame them. You might blame the law. And if, if he ever gets to a judge, you might blame the judge that he didn't get the right sentence. And, you know, like, why do we blame all of these different people? Well, the answer is quite simple. Well, no, I feel we blame them because they did it. <laughs> they did it. They, they took the action. Like, the thief stole your gear, didn't he? So... So you feel justified blaming him, don't you? Right? And, and so, so we have a tendency to go ahead and blame people. We even blame people who didn't have a part of the whole thing. Like the judge who sentenced the thief, he didn't, he didn't steal your furniture or he didn't steal your, from your flat. But we still, if, the, if we feel the judge's sentence is not strong enough, then we blame him too even though he wasn't involved in the original theft. So we have a tendency with blame to sometimes blame because the person actually did it, and sometimes we blame just because we can. And there's no rhyme or reason as to who we blame sometimes, as to who's who's actually responsible. The issue of responsibility is different to blame. Is the thief responsible for thieving from you? Yes, of course. So the thief is responsible. He is, he is the person who made the choice to act unlovingly and take from you. But why did he take from you and not your next door neighbour? There's got to be something going on there, doesn't there? He, how many people live in Gothenburg? 400,000. Okay. <laughs> Around about. This thief had a choice of 400,000 people. And he chose you. There's got to be a reason. You must have invited him somehow, right? You must have invited him somehow. There's got to be something going on in the soul of you that needs this event to be confronted with a certain truth. 
right? And, and it could be just that you have a lot of grief about things being taken from you that you're not experiencing. And how is this, is this grief going to come out of you if you're unwilling to connect to it? The only way it's going to come out of you is by, the, by an event being created where you're triggered into grief and then maybe you'll choose to feel your grief now instead of trying to avoid it all the time. That could be just a simple answer to that event as to why that event occurred. Every single event has a cause. Now let's look at the issues of blame, responsibility and cause. Because these are separate issues. Right? And if we could say blame, blame is a very emotional, it's a very emotional thing to do, isn't it? To blame. You know, usually it involves the emotion of anger, frustration, annoyance, or other such emotions that are all linked to anger or rage. So blame is an emotional process, and blame often is not accurately assigned. In other words, we often blame people when they're not really to blame. Right? Because we can get away with it. We can get away with blaming that person without the person hurting us or judging us or punishing us some way. Oftentimes we blame the people who are easy to blame. Because if we blame the actual person, they might hurt us the more. And so what we do is we choose somebody who won't hurt us more and then we blame them instead. We have a lot of emotional reasons why we choose blame and who we choose to blame is very much driven by our own emotional condition of fear, how much fear we're in. But there is a person responsible for any action that they took that is negative, that is out of harmony with love. And also, you're also responsible for every loving action you took. Right. So every loving action you took in the course of a day, you're totally responsible for. It's great. And every unloving action you took in the course of a day, you're also totally responsible for. And that's great too. Because this is how the law works against the person who or with the person who is responsible. But the cause of you doing something is very different from taking responsibility for it. So why did the thief steal from your house? The, there must be an emotional thing going on inside of him that would cause him to make such a choice. Can you see that? And so therefore, there's got to be a cause inside of him that caused him to decide to go and thieve somebody's house. But the fact that he chose your house means there has to be a cause inside of you that caused him to choose your house and not some other of the 400,000 people homes that he could have chosen. Can you see that? So he is responsible for the choice to go and thieve and there is a cause inside of him that, that, that caused him to exercise his will to thieve. But the fact that he chose your house to do it involves a cause inside of your own soul that caused him to be attracted to your house rather than your next door neighbour's house. That's how fine, and it's even much finer than that, the law of attraction. Is there any questions about that yet? No, no fire away, go. Um, okay, I'm a bit nervous. I hope I can do it in the English language. It goes back to the lady who asked you, AJ, about how is it ex to explain, like Africa, other countries, yep. children, innocent born, um, starving, and you explain, sorry, <laughs> and you explain, and I totally agree, that it starts with the parents. Yep. Yeah. And society. Yep. Yeah, yep. and um, my question is, you brought one point up where my question turns around. You said something, there is also something already in the, in the soul of the child, because I have two questions. One is, some children, um, there's everywhere spiritual influence, some children contacted by spirits. So where is, and we just can be contacted or receiving this, if there's already a feel in us who has this attachment, is this something who is also created, passed on from our parents to us? Or is it coming already when our soul comes in this life, given 
on the way by God. And um, the other question had... Can I, can I before you ask the other yes, question, yes, there's a fair bit course. in this question that you've of just course. asked. So, <laughs> so let's focus on that question. The answer is very similar to the answer that I've already given in a, in a lot of ways. So let's, let's, look at, let's look at it in terms of what's actually happening. Many children are overcloaked by spirits from the moment they are conceived. Right? So even while they're in the womb of their mother, many spirits try to attach to this child. And often a lot of congenital defects are caused through these attachments. So this is why many children now are born as well with congenital defects and other problems because they've already had their body's energy systems while they're growing distorted by the attachments of these spirits. The, the issue they face, though, is this. The parents have some emotional holes, some things going on inside of them that causes the child to be exposed to these, these events. In other words, if the parents changed what was happening inside of them, the child would no longer be exposed to those external influences. And in fact, in a perfect situation, the way God created it perfectly, once the parent had healed all of their own emotional injuries that are out of harmony with love, they would not be able to give birth to a child that had any defect. Right? They also would not be able to give birth to a child that was overcloaked by a spirit because such a, such a, no spirits could even penetrate the protective barrier of love that surrounded the child. So the fact that these events happen are all part of what we've been discussing. They're all still a part of what's going on at the society level and at the family level in terms of what the law of attraction is bringing the parents in particular. Now, if you think about it again, and I said this earlier, but it's very important to understand, if a parent does not change their behaviour because of what's happening to their child then is there any hope that they'll change their behaviour for anything else? Highly unlikely, isn't it? So, so this is what we need to bear in mind. If we are not able to love our own children by taking responsibility for our own unhealed emotions and working our way through them, then it's highly unlikely we'll be driven to do that for any other reason. And this is a beautiful gift God's given us in a way to, to expose to us either the extent of our love or the extent of our unloving behaviour. The fact that so many bad things happen to children on this planet is an indication as a society that we have a lot to learn about love. Yeah. And this is something that we are attracting to tell us, hmm, we have a lot to learn about love still. Yeah. And even if we looked at the physical things that are happening to our children, I don't know, for those of you who have had children, Usually within the first few weeks or months they get sick, don't they? Have you noticed that? And we all say the same thing generally and that is we go, oh, that's because they haven't developed an immunity yet to, to that particular thing or things like that. Right? That's what we say. What a silly concept if you think about it. The reality is I have and my, and my wife or partner has an immunity to those things now. Why didn't that immunity enter the child? doesn't make any sense. They're living in the womb of their own mother. Surely the immunity would somehow enter the child if we dealt with something. So that the reality is even every sickness our children get is a reflection of something going on inside of ourselves, something that's going on that we need to address that is out of harmony with love. And if we address it, we have the potential to change it. See, as soon as we address it, it will instantly change. In fact, the law of attraction is perfect in its operation, just like all of God's laws. And so therefore, the instant that we address the issue is the instant the issue is solved. Yep. And that's the beauty of being able to measure it, is that you instantly know you've resolved the problem. And I feel that's one of the problems that we face on the planet with regard to everything we analyse with regard to sickness and disease and other trauma and other pain, we, we have a tendency to search for somebody to blame who is not ourselves. We do not take responsibility for the fact that we have attracted the event. And because we're unable to do that, 
we never address the emotional or the soul-based condition that causes the event. Right? Now, because of that, our law of attraction, or when you say our law of attraction, it's not the right way to say it, God's law of attraction is going to expose to me the fact that I'm continuing to avoid responsibility and what the cause is. And this is what I feel is happening on the planet with so many different things and issues. And in particular with issues involving children, uh, you know, what we call human rights or lack of love towards other people, a lack of love towards our environment, a lack of love towards the animals and other, and other living organisms on the planet, our lack of love towards nature. These are all things that are demonstrating to us our lack of love that's inside of our soul. And if we address the cause, we can solve all of these problems. Every single one of them can be addressed and solved. In the case of the cause of a spirit attachment with a child, if the parents work through their emotional situation and work through why they attracted such an event, then they would cover over the whole inside of themselves that created the event and the child, the spirit who's attached to the child would leave the child. Right? So, so that's the answer to that specific issue but the reality is it's the same answer for every issue <laughs> yeah that makes sense yep and uh, if we go down to mary and then up to carola so if that mic can go up there and that mic can go oh mary's already got one. yep uh just to clarify you're saying that the law of attraction operates on the condition of the soul so when children are exposed to negative things there is an injury within their soul there is. Yep. And but, in but, but unfortunately, the other thing we must uh, admit is that they inherited this injury from their parents' soul. And it was transmitted to them as soon as they entered the world through conception. So therefore, who's to blame or who is responsible for this injury? Not the child. You, do you understand the difference? Like, see, we've got to be very careful that we assign the responsibility to where it was created. And the responsibility of what's happening to the child rests with the environment and the parent, not with the child. Yep. Second, if we go back to Africa, mm -hmm. those people who are suffering in a lot of poverty, they do have a condition within their soul that is attracting that. Certainly. However, what I feel is that we have a condition in our soul that That's is even allowing worse. it. That's right. That is actually worse. worse. It's actually yeah. worse, yes. Yeah. So let's look at the situation of any poverty, for example, in terms of who is to blame or who is responsible and what the cause is. The reality is that there are many nations on the planet who, as a collective nation, their collective condition, so if we call it their collective soul condition, is that they attract rape of resources. Uh, sources by more wealthy countries. Is that not true? Obviously, if they had enough resources to look after themselves and they had excess, then it would be fine. But if they don't have enough resources to look after themselves and all the excess is going somewhere else, then obviously it's a rape, right? It's a rape of all the resources, yeah? The collective soul condition of those countries are they attract the rape of resources for some reason. Well, we've got to look, that, that's the thing they need to look at as to why they attract it. But who has the worst condition? A person who rapes, even if it's resources, Or the person who receives the rape of the resources? Who's got the worst condition? The person who does this, is it not? So the collective soul condition, the collective condition of the Western countries that finish up raping the resources of the other countries and not sharing those resources that they have, means that the collective condition of the Western countries is actually worse from a loving, from a love perspective, than the condition of the countries that are being raped. Does that, everyone get that? From a love perspective? Okay, if we bear that in mind then and we look at the event that would be attracted, the law of attraction happens, 
where a certain country gets raped of its resources, which then causes malnutrition and other problems inside of the country for many of its inhabitants. There's got to be an emotion inside of them that caused this country to, to attack this country in this way, right? That attracted it happening to this country. But the reality is this country was willing to rape any country. So therefore its condition was pretty bad before it even begun. And then the fact that it went ahead with the rape of the resource means that it is even becoming worse as a collective condition. The fact that this country is willing to engage in the rape right, of the resource means that its collective condition must be worse. And it's like the thief we were talking about. It's willing, it's willing, it already has a feeling inside of it that it's able to thieve. It's just who does it thieve? Does it go and thieve from... So you look at the USA coming to thieve something... <laughs> And I'll choose the USA because many of people do think that they do thief things. And I'm not saying that the USA should be singled out with that particular thing. Because many Western countries are the same. But let's say it decides to go to war in a country like, like it did do in Iraq. Right? Now, if it couldn't choose Iraq because Iraq happened to be Sweden and it would never have gotten away with Sweden with coming and raping Sweden's resources for a lot of reasons, what did it do? It chose a country that the rest of the countries would sit by and let it be raped. Can you see that? Because if, it if the US chose you and your country to be raped of its resources, what do you think would have happened then? You would have had the whole European... Union, ready to go to war with America, wouldn't you? If that had probably happened. All right? But the fact is that when Iraq gets raped, the whole European Union is not willing to go to war with America. Can you see the difference? So can you see how that was a, a, a part of the choice? The fact is that it couldn't make the choice to rape a country that had the power to defend itself. So what it did instead was made the choice to rape a country that couldn't defend itself. Can you see that? Yep. And in the process of doing that, it demonstrates, America demonstrates its own condition. And interestingly enough, the rest of the world demonstrated their own condition. We were all willing to sit by and watch the rape. And in Australia's case... We were not only willing to sit by and watch it, we were willing to sit by and take part in it. Does that make sense? So what's happening, and I'm being quite strong with my language here now, the reason why is we need to understand that actually the person who does the damage to the other is obviously already in a darker condition. This is why many of you are not having much success with your mums and dads in terms of getting them to admit that they did something wrong with you. Because the person who does something wrong with you is generally in a darker condition than you were at the time it was done wrong. Do you understand? Just like this country is in a darker condition than this country when it chose to rape the country. The rest of the world was in a darker condition than this country because it allowed the rape of the country. You see? These are all things that are happening. So I'll just fix up the mic. These are all things that are happening. Because the law of attraction is demonstrating to every one of those countries there's something going wrong here with love. So this country obviously has an issue of loving itself. This country here has an even worse issue. It's unable to love others. And it's arrogant and loves itself too much, I suppose you could say. If, is there such a thing as loving itself too much? No. So it has to be that its attitude is not one of love, even towards itself, but one of greed. It has to exist. Now these things are demonstrating, this is the beauty of it, is that it's all demonstrating God's truth to us as an entire world. This event is showing us that what is actually happening is out of harmony with love in these events. And it's out of harmony with love in a lot of areas. This country here needs to be helped with its love of self. 
this country here needs to be helped with its arrogance and its, and its attitude that it can go ahead and rape somebody else without, and get away with it. And that means that the people in that country need to be helped with that attitude. And it means the people in this country need to be helped with that attitude because it's a collective condition which is an adding up of all the different people's condition in that location. Can you see? So it's quite an involved process when you look at the law of attraction. So Karola, who's next? Um, I'm, I'm back at the children. Yes. And, and you said uh, the parents need to deal with it for the children. But I think the children can save the parent. No. I'm sorry, I can't agree. Okay. A child who has an undeveloped sense of its own will cannot save somebody who has a developed sense of their own will. So the reality is the child can trigger emotions in the parents that can certainly assist the parents. And in fact, the whole reason why that particular child has been attracted to those parents is to do such a thing, is to actually help the parent work through their unloving emotions. But the reality is the child can't, as a choice, help the parent. Because, and the parent can't rely on that either because the reality is the parent is the one with all the control. The parent's the one with all of the power. And, and so it's very, very hard for a person with no power to assist a person with power without there being some collective action. Mm, because uh, maybe you are in lower age than I thought of. Oh, you were thinking like a teenager or something, yes. were you? Right, fire you away can. with your teenager explanation for yes, me. Uh, sorry? Tell me about your teenager explanation. No, it's, it's not like that. But uh, I, myself, uh, instead of that my parents is going to deal with things that I blame them for, yeah. I felt that I worked with myself and they were relieved. Do you understand? I understand what you're saying. but <laughs> So if, if you have uh, impossible parents and you want to help a shi children, a child... Let's look at what's really happening. Can, can you do something if I change my person? Well, let's, let's look at what's really happening with our parents, girl, for a start. So here's you, and, when, and here's your parents, right? Now, obviously, obviously, if you have specific emotions, for example, you have an a, a anger with your parents, and then you, and underneath the anger with your parent is some fear that you had about what they did with you or whatever. And then underneath that there was some grieving to do that you needed to let go of. Obviously when you get out of your anger into your fear, then your parents are no longer receiving your anger. I agree. And if that's the case, then those parents are no longer feeling your anger. And that's certainly going to be a relief for them. However, all of your grief most probably, for most people, came from your parents. And the fact is, even when you were angry, these parents should have been more willing to address their emotions of why you were angry with them. They should have been, but they weren't. So while you go through this process, which is a great process to go through, right? it does not mean that your parents' actual condition that caused your grief is ever going to be addressed. Right? The reality is they're just relieved that they're no longer getting their anger anymore. But they have not yet addressed why they did it. They have not yet addressed why they created your grief. That's the thing God's trying to get them to address. So they are going to continue to attract events. And your anger is not one of those events, by the way. But they're going to continue to attract events that display to them their own condition as to why they harmed their own children. They will attract those events. So, so while you can address these issues yourself, and there will be a degree of relief in your parents when you address these issues, which, which is great because you're no longer projecting at them those particular emotions that you had that you no longer have. The problem is they themselves still may never address their particular unhealthy and unloving causal behaviour, the reason why they damaged you in the first place. <coughs> And they need to make that choice, whatever you do, and you cannot relieve them of that. There's nothing you can do that will actually relieve them of that, except telling them the truth and loving them. Nothing else can be done. That will and then the children uh, don't have it anymore. 
You don't have it yet. Once you release, once you release the gear, gear that your parents gave you, you no longer have it anymore. So your law of attraction changes, but they still have it. And until they go through the process of releasing their soul condition, they will still attract the same events. Yes, because I, I want to know how to help small children that has impossible parents. From a society perspective, the only way to help a small child that has impossible parents is to relieve the child of its parents. Yeah, it's the only really possible way because the child is under the control of those parents and unless the parents are loving, there is no real way to relieve the child of their unloving behaviour unless the parents are willing to change. So the reality is, you see, these are part of our society beliefs about families. We all believe that families should stick together no matter what. Can't agree. Families should never stick together when the family is being unloving to each other. They should all go their separate ways <laughs> or learn about love. They need to do one of those two things rather than stick together. Because the reality is while they're sticking together and being unloving with each other, they are just causing more damage to each other. That's not loving. We need to stop doing that. Does that make sense? Probably. So you've got to be careful about our family definitions. You see, if we truly love, we'll view everyone on earth as my family, and therefore I will not have any sense of inequality with dealing with you. I will deal with you the exact same way that I deal with my son that was born to me. I won't have any difference in the way I treat the both of you if I actually view you as my sister as much as I view him as my brother. And my son is my brother. Because he's not my, my son, he's God's son. And that makes me and him brothers. Yeah. Right at the back. If we just get the mic up there. Yeah, I wonder if you would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, ways and methods to increase love for people and for nations and ways of doing that. I would love to do that, actually. So, because that's a part of this law, actually. The whole, remember, the whole purpose of this law is to help you increase the level of love that you have within your own soul towards everything around you. So the whole purpose of this law is to correct any unloving behaviour and actions that you have and to turn them into loving behaviours and actions. That's the whole reason why God created this law in the first place. So, so it makes sense that we need to go through a discussion of, of how do we engage this law to refine our condition of love? How, how can we be refined by what happens in this process of this law. So what I would like to do is, uh, it's probably time for a break now. So what if we have a break to about quarter to four, and then we'll enter the discussion about this with that subject of how we go ahead and become more loving through this interaction with this law.